Good morning and welcome, Christ Church. So glad you're here with us this morning. Let's stand to our feet as we begin. I'm going to read from Psalm chapter 105. As we come to seek the Lord together this morning, this is what he has to say to us. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. As we gather each week, we seek the Lord together. He is our strength. Let's sing to him. Welcome. to be praised. Well, really excited this morning. We're going to celebrate baptisms. 
Well, before we do, we're going to sing another song, and it just highlights the victory that Christ has already won us over sin and death. And the way that he won that victory wasn't through strength or power, but through humility. Philippians chapter 2 says this, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a sermon, being born in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. It's through Jesus' humility that he won a victory over sin and the grave. It's this incredible thing that God, the, the creator of all the universe, would die on a cross for us. And in just a few moments, we're going to celebrate that gospel truth in the new life in Christ in baptism. But let's sing of Christ's victory over sin. in Christ, we know how the story will end. I know how the story ends. We will be with you again. He saves. You're my Savior, my defense. There's no Sing that again. Come on. I know how. Oh, I know how the story ends. We'll be with you. We will be with you again. He's our Savior. You're my Savior, my defense. There's no
please take your seats for just a moment. We have an opportunity to do baptisms. For some of you that are wondering why do we do baptisms, if you know the story after Jesus' death and resurrection, in Matthew chapter 28, he says that I want you to go out into all the world. I want you to make disciples. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So we know that for the life of every Christian, baptism is an important part of it. It doesn't mean that baptism is what saves us, makes God love us more, but it's a public declaration of our faith. Paul talks about it more when he says in Romans chapter 6, he says that it's through baptism that we are buried into Christ's death. And it's also through baptism that we are raised to new life. So the way that we do baptism where you're fully put under the water, it's that experience of going down like into the grave of Jesus Christ. And then there's an exciting part. This is the part we will clap and celebrate as they come up out of the water, signifying that new life that's only found in Jesus Christ. One of our candidates today wanted to share some of their testimonies. So before we have our baptism, I'm going to have Abby come forward, and she's going to share her story with us. Hi, my name is Abby. I don't really think I was born in a Christian family. My parents both consider themselves Christians, but I think in my family it was more often viewed as a religion than a relationship. I never really knew who Jesus was, and as I got older and we stopped going to church, I even started to question him. It wasn't until the beginning of sixth grade did I begin to learn who he really was, and that is because in sixth grade, me and Emma Helmer were put into the same advisory. I think we clicked almost immediately, and soon we became inseparable. As I got to know her better, I also got to know her family, and I began to see how Jesus is such a huge part of their family. It took Emma time and a lot of persisting, honestly, before I started going to church with her and her family. I was building my relationship with God, and I thank you so much, Emma, for guiding me to do that. It was Mrs. Emma's mom who gave me my Bible. It means so much to me, and the verse you highlighted is, and will always be my favorite verse, Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the loving God of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And I promise that I have and always will let that love guide my life. Ever since I have let Jesus into my life, I feel so much happier and more thankful for everything around me. I feel like a better person because of him. And I believe that Christ died for me and has forgiven my sins. So this is me publicly declaring my faith in him. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.
Let's stand together as we respond. Would you stand with us as we respond? Father, God, we thank you for those who are in Christ Jesus, who have put their faith in you. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We are forever yours in Christ Jesus, adopted as your sons and daughters. God, we thank you for that truth. We thank you that we got to celebrate new life in Christ Jesus. We pray that for each one of us, that you'd help us even today to walk in that newness of life through the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's just...
Praise God. And give a hand to the candidates one more time. It's so good to celebrate with you all. Well, right now, we're going to take just a moment to greet each other, but as we do so, the 5th through 8th grade students can go ahead and be dismissed to their classes. I'm Luke Babby with this week's church-wide announcements. We hope you find ways to know God, grow in faith, and live it out in ways that are making a difference in your life and the lives of those around you. We have a chance to live out our faith by providing hope for the holidays alongside our global ministry partner, International Needs. With so many Ukrainian refugees living in Romania, families are still struggling with everyday needs. But with your generosity, we can continue to support them in practical ways. International Needs is able to deliver much-needed necessities through its smaller relief convoys that are able to travel into conflict zones. Your donation can provide a family with groceries, clothing, school supplies, or even housing. You'll find cards at your campus today that walk you through how to donate, so make sure you pick up one of those before you leave today. Consider how you can play a part in helping those in desperate need. And, as always, thank you for faithfully giving to Christchurch. There are so many ways to give. Visit ChristchurchIL.org give to learn more. We want you to know that every dollar matters as we seek to help people discover life with God. That's all from me. Have a great rest of your day. Good morning, Christ Church. My name is Paul Fowler. I serve as our Lake Forest campus pastor. Thank you all for being here today on this lovely Veterans Day weekend. And I think no matter how you're walking in the door today, maybe this has been a frustrating week for you, maybe for you, you're feeling great today. This is a great opportunity for us to be thankful for the freedoms that we have in this country. So just to take a moment to thank our veterans here that have served and those uh, on this special weekend that we thank them. So our mission at Christ Church is to help people discover life with God. So I want to say a special welcome to any of you that are new here today. Maybe for you, you're looking for where you go next. You want to take that next step. You want to know who God is. And we are just so thankful that you are here with us. In the pew in front of you, you're going to find this blue connect card or there's a QR code. Take your phone out and scan it. Fill this out. Let us know that you're here. I'm going to be at the Welcome Center after the service. I would love to meet you. We also have a free gift we'd love to get to you today. It's a book from our senior pastor and a gift card to a local coffee shop. We're just so thankful that you are with us. So please do come out to the lobby after the service. I would love to meet you. Also, just thank you so much for your generosity to Christ Church. As you saw on the video, there's a special project that we're a part of, Hope for the Holidays. This is a donation that you can make to families that are living in Romania at the moment, but they are there from Ukraine. And what you can do for $25 is help provide groceries. For $1,000, you can help provide housing for these families. This is an excellent organization, International Needs Romania, that we are working with. And I know there's a lot of other things you've been generous. Uh, Operation Christmas Child, there's boxes that need to be brought back today. Also, uh, we are so thankful for your generosity. I was recently in Africa and saw firsthand some of the great things that you all are doing. We're, we're providing school for uh, young women who are just graduated from high school. You guys are so generous. Thank you so much for your generosity. So I encourage you, after the service, visit the table in the lobby or you'll get a card to make a donation to International Needs Romania and the Ukrainian refugees they are helping to support. I also want to mention that, ladies, coming up this Thursday is a girls' night in, so would love to have you there. I've heard they're excellent. I've never been myself. Uh, there's a QR code you can scan, and you can register for that. It's going to be at Judy Cole's home in Lake Forest. And also, we are in November. We know that Thanksgiving is coming up, so we always gather together on Thanksgiving Day at our Crossroads campus. Would love to have you there. But at Lake Forest, we also do a Thanksgiving Eve service that we call Pie Night, there's going to be way too many pies there that we can eat, so come and eat as much pie as you like. But this is a great time for us to be, have a time of worship, for us to share what we're thankful for about this year. So we'd love to be together on those holidays. So we were supposed to continue on in our Ephesians series uh, today. Uh, Senior Pastor Mike Woodruff is going to come up in just a moment, but he's caught a, a bit of an audible. 
Uh, he's been a ser- had a sermon he's been working on, and we know this is uh, an interesting week in the news cycle with the election and everything going on. But it's an important moment for us to stop and realize where our citizenship is, who we are in Christ, and what that means in our future. So Mike's going to be speaking from Isaiah chapter 6 today. But before he comes, would you join with me in prayer? God, we thank you for an opportunity to be together. And God, I do just want to pray for those here today that are feeling heavy in the moment with life or whatever else it might be, God. We also are, are celebrating with those who today feels like a good day, God. We know that we come in all different places, but I pray for all of us that our focus would be on you, Jesus. That we would capture the moment that's an opportunity to show the love you've shown to us, to those out there in the world. Thank you, God, for your love for us, and it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Good morning. Um, Good to see you today. Hope you are enjoying this spectacular Chicago fall that we've been having. Uh, Exceptional, I think. We're on top of most of the leaves in our family. Um, So uh, more leaves to be, more leaves to be raked, no doubt. But um, and greetings to those joining us uh, at the 01 or Highland Park, Crossroads, Vernon Hills. And um, uh, we had a, it, it's been a good weekend in part because we had a big Renew Communities event last night to uh, raise money. Uh, so we now have, I mean, I just want you to be encouraged. So we will uh, sort of uh, roll out eight, build eight homes for the poorest of the working poor this year. We're on track now. It looks like we'll do 10 homes next year, almost a house a month. So it's happening. It's really an exciting program and and, uh, thankful for your ongoing support of that. So uh, as as is mentioned, I've called a bit of an audible. And an audible, you know, football terms, you step to the line of scrimmage, you read the defense and you go, "Uh uh-oh, I need to change the play. And so they yell, kill, 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 and then call some new play. And that suggests that I've changed the sermon in light of something recent, obviously the election. That's not really what's happened. So for the record, about a year ago, <laughs> I circled this date and said, okay, that's a different, that's a unique date. And so the, you know, the, the schedule calls for us to be in Ephesians chapter 5 uh, in, the, in the, the, the Walks at Stand series. And I kept saying, you know, Four months ago, I'm not going to do that. That's not the sermon I'm going to preach then. I, I, and I, started working, I started working on this sermon, trying to think, okay, so where, where are we going to be? This has uh, been a bit more of a, uh, of, of a polarized country. We've had challenges in recent elections. I thought, okay, where are people going to be, and what do they need to hear from a pastor? So... Um, I was a year ago, back when, the, back when the election was between Biden and Trump, I started working on this sermon, and I finished it last month, because I wanted to be able to say, I finished this, the polls were switching back and forth, no idea who was going to win. And that's in part because I wanted to be able to say, I'm not, I'm not reflecting on the results of the election, I am calling you beyond the results of the election. Uh, I bring a different perspective to this, and I want to I share that perspective with you. And um, so uh, I, I, I say this because I want to help you understand that ultimately our citizenship is in the city of God. This is Augustine's language, a book called City of God, in which he said we as, as, as Christ followers have dual citizenships. We are, we are members of the citizen of, uh, we are citizens of God and we are to live Today, as if we are, we are an outpost of the kingdom of God, we are, we are to be about being disciples of Jesus uh, more than we are members of any kind of political party. Uh, and then we're also members of the city of man, and, and that's important, but it doesn't ultimately shape us. So I realize uh, that some of you are, are uh, here because you're, you're, you're confused and you're hurt and you're mad or whatever, and you, you've got uh, some need to lament, and I realize others of you are uh, coming in much more um, uh, hopeful or happy position. And I, I just want to say, uh, I'm calling you past either of those two perspectives, and um, 
And I'm delivering a message that in one sense uh, is unique to this country in this moment, and in another sense is not. So for 2,000 years, pastors have stood in front of congregations and tried to help them understand what God is doing or what's going on or how they're supposed to live. And in some of these cases, it's oppressive communist regimes or it's countries in civil war or it's all kinds of different, you know, different political scenarios. I've, I've had a number of people saying to me, oh, man, your job this week, it's so hard. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I'm like, yeah, you know, there will, there will be easier Sundays. I don't circle every Sunday a year out and go, okay, this one I need to pay attention to. But at the same time, I mean, we're living in a country, uh, a democratic republic, where we have incredible freedoms, freedom of speech and freedom of religion and, and freedom of, of, of other things, freedom of assembly, uh, there's a lot of wealth. So uh, this is not nearly as hard as some people think. Uh, I, I, I need to call you beyond the rhetoric of the moment and help you reframe what is going on. So let me say, this is not a sermon in which I say politics don't matter. Uh, because if we understand politics to be how we are going to live together, how we're going to get along, how we're going to make decisions, how we're going to allocate resources, how we're going to deal with issues of justice, how we're going to care for the poor, then, then what's important to understand is that God cares a great deal about politics. And uh, again, I, I do my best to, to not speak uh, as a partisan ever, but uh, you can't simply say that politics don't matter. I mean, uh, again, we're citizens of the citizen, we're, we are citizens of the city of God, but the city of man matters, and it matters to God. And to say we're not going to do anything with politics means it's just a vote for the status quo. And the status quo has problems. There's, there's all kinds of issues that are not what the kingdom of God will look like. They're not, there's not enough justice, there's not enough righteousness, there's not enough grace. And so it's not to say I'm not going to pay any attention to uh, these events, or I'm expecting you to think that politics don't matter. Churches that did not speak out against slavery in the 19th century because they didn't want to do politics, that, that, that's wrong. That's just not acceptable. This is also not a sermon in which I'm going to tell you, you simply have to move on, like you have to get over it, uh, wherever you're at. And for the record, I am concerned about two groups of people today. I'm concerned about those who are, who are feeling unseen or hurt or angry or, or mad. Uh, and I'm concerned about those who are, who are euphoric because at some point their outsized expectations of what's going to happen are going to have to be right-sized and they're going to be disappointed later on. And so I, I'm, there's, 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 there's a lot of people that need to hear something today. I want you not to hear that I'm telling you you simply have to move on. You might need some time to process this and to level set things. But here's what I am saying. Nothing in heaven has changed. God is still on the throne. Jesus is still at his right hand. Right, The kingdom of God is going to come. And so we need to live today in light of eternity. And we need to live today as citizens of the city of, of God. And that God is not surprised by election results and these things don't ultimately frame who we are. Uh, it is worth noting that God is still on his throne and that uh, presidents will come and go, but we are called to a mission that is unchanging. So um, I want to help you understand that position, and, and I'm going to do that by taking us to Isaiah 6. Let me make one note before we go there. Uh, I have been generally encouraged by the events of the last few days. I sort of expected that things might be a, a lot rougher than they have been. Six months ago, I wrote, uh, it can be hard to peer around the corner, but some things seem likely. Uh, one, a bevy of books are going to come out about what went wrong at Boeing. Uh, two, uh, there's going to be protests over the results of the November election. So for the most part, there hasn't been uh, the kind of anger we saw four years ago, and that, that's a good thing. Uh, I appreciate the concession speech that uh, Vice President Harris made. I appreciate uh, President Biden saying, 
uh, look, you, you got to love your country when you win and when you don't win. And uh, we're going to have, uh, you know, an orderly transition. So we have much to be thankful for. And I want to help you think about that by uh, taking you to Isaiah 6. So this is, the, this is the passage about six months ago because my prayer had been, okay, Lord, where am I supposed to be uh, on this Sunday? So Isaiah is one of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, he's called a major prophet. So the prophets are those who speak for God to the people. Priests stand between God and the people and speak to God for the people. Prophets stand between God and the people and they speak for God to the people. So he's a prophet. We call him a major prophet because he wrote a really long book. So there's 12 minor prophets. Their, their works were all like one page and they fit on one scroll. Then there were these major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. They wrote really long books. So Isaiah lived 3,000 years ago in Jerusalem. And his message was directed at uh, mostly the Jews living in Judah. So remember, the kingdom, the 12 tribes get united under David. David hands it off to his son Solomon. The kingdom remains united. Solomon dies, and the kingdom quickly splits in two. And you have the 10 northern tribes called, unfortunately, Israel. So Israel is now called Israel again you got Israel and Judah, the southern two tribes called Judah. So the northern ten tribes are going to be taken over by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. And we never hear from them again. Isaiah was speaking, directing his comments to the, to the southern two, two and a half tribes that were located in Jerusalem. And he is, is basically telling them, Three things. So it's, it's a complicated book. It's got a complicated literary structure. It's easy to get lost. There's a lot of different genres. There's poetry. There's repetition. But basically, Isaiah says three things to the people. Number one, God chose you to represent him. Two, you've done a horrible job of it. You've been evil. You've been selfish. You've been full of pride. You really have messed this up. Three, you're going to be judged for your wickedness. So Isaiah, chapters 1 through 5, is very dark. Like he, he, Isaiah comes out swinging and says, you're, 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 God says to you, you're wicked, you're vile, and you're going to get chopped down. Judah is, is portrayed as a tree, and the tree is going to get turned into a stump. And so it's, it's dark, it's foreboding. Now, it's, it's not game-ending, because in Isaiah chapter 11, there's this language about that the, the stump of Jesse, Jesse was David's father, so he's referring to King David. A promise was made to King David that his descendants would rule. It says the stump of Jesse is going to have a new shoot, right? There's going to be life that comes out of this, uh, out of Judah after it gets mowed over uh, by people. So that sets it all up. And uh, what I want to do is, is to walk you through the first few verses of Isaiah chapter 6, which are very famous and very important. So Isaiah has been speaking to the people, and he's been saying, okay, you've messed this up, you were supposed to represent me, you've done a bad job, but trouble's coming. And then, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So the year that King Uzziah died was saying in the year that King Uzziah died is sort of like saying uh, right after 9-11. Like it's a, it's, a, it's a thing. It's a big moment. Everybody remembers. Uzziah had been the king of Judah for 52 years. So most people had never known life where Uzziah wasn't the king. And he'd been, for the most part, a pretty good king. Uh, he had, he had uh, you know, kept the enemies at bay. He put money into the treasury. As kings go, he's a pretty good king. People had a stable life. Now, towards the end of his life, he, he makes some stupid moves and things unwind. One of the very sobering things about studying the Bible is to see how few end well. All these leaders end up doing something stupid, 
And the result of their stupidity is it plays out over time. And, you know, David with his adultery with Bathsheba and he multiplies wives. And by the end of his life, his life is a soap opera. You say the same with Solomon. You can just, you see that sin just sort of, it takes some time, but it grows and it causes problems. So Uzziah uh, makes this move at the end. He's sort of full of pride. He's, he's impressed with his accomplishments. And he goes into the temple and he plays the role of a priest. So pretty, pretty uh, important to understand that the roles of prophet, priest, and king, which will all be united when Jesus comes along, he is the one who is the ultimate prophet. He's our high priest. He is the king of kings. So Jesus is going to, all these offices are foreshadowing who Jesus is going to be. But you're not supposed to have two of the offices at the same time. You get a little bit of that with Moses, who's a prophet and is always sort of a leader uh, and a little priestly. And you get a little bit of that with Samuel and Melchizedek. There's a few sort of, sort of exceptions, but for the most part, it's well established. If you're the king, you're not supposed to be a priest. And, and uh, Uzziah walks into the temple and he starts to do priestly functions. And the priests immediately come and they're, they're yelling at him and they're saying, you can't do this. And Uzziah, being the king, starts to yell at them. And while he's yelling at them, he breaks out in leprosy. And this is sort of the end of his public life. He gets escorted off, off the scene. You, at that point, leprosy is believed to be contagious. If you're a leper, you go to a leper colony. And so he is, he is uh, moved outside of the city gates. And he will live for a while longer. And he'll rule through his son. But he doesn't do a very good job. And as a result, the Assyrians, who are the, they're the ones that had wiped out the northern ten tribes, the Assyrians start to mobilize power, and it looks like they're going to come against Judah. So it's at that moment he dies, and this is a bad moment. Okay, here come the Assyrians. We've lost our king. We've never had another king. We're at risk. And it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Bad things are happening. I don't, like, I don't like the politics of the moment, transition. It feels, it, feels a little, it feels a little unsettled. And then Isaiah says, at that moment, I get called up to heaven, and I see God. And he's high and exalted. And the train of his robe fills the temple. So trains on robes, we don't, not lots of, we don't have kings. We don't have people walking around with robes with long trains, but generally, the more important you were, the longer the train. You see this to some extent with brides who could have a long train. If a bride is very important or very wealthy, sometimes there will be a long train. So he says, I see God and the train, this is just code for he was so majestic. The train in his robe filled the temple, right? It goes to the walls. And you can even imagine that it just sort of folds back on top of each other, just fills up. I mean, this is how significant he is. And he says that, uh, that around him were seraphs. So this is a kind of angel, a special angel, created to be in the presence of God. And with six wings, uh, two they covered their faces, two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. So the thing to take away from the, the seraphs is that they're created by God to be in his presence, and yet they can't stand in it. They can't be in his presence. So they have extra wings basically to just hide behind. So they're shielding themselves because the brilliance of God, the glory of God, the Shekinah majesty of God, is it, you, you can't get that close to the sun. And so they're shielding themselves. This is how amazing God is. And by the way, they're saying, holy, holy, holy. And, and <laughs> they will be saying the same thing, by the way, a couple thousand years later when we get to the book of Revelation. They're just saying, holy, holy, holy. Like, that's, that's what they do. And it's not that that's their job, which would obviously sound very boring. Uh, that's all I do, okay, forever. Uh, but this is just their natural response to being in the presence of God. So, as I have pointed out numerous times, there's big worship services that happen Saturday afternoons, college stadiums, and Sunday afternoons, 
NFL stadiums. And so you see people who, who worship, right? They jump up and down, they sing, they high five. They're, nobody has to tell them, right, to sing the fight song. Nobody has to tell them that they should be excited and say, did you see that catch? Did you see that? I mean, when you're amazed, you're amazed and you respond. It's a, it's a default reaction. And so forever, the angels in the presence of God are saying, Holy, holy, holy. And they repeat it three times, which is a big deal because in, in Hebrew, which is the Old Testament was written, and to some extent also in Greek, the New Testament, um, you don't use the word very, very often. You just repeat the point you're trying to make. So you might remember Jesus at some point will say, truly, truly, I say unto you. Right? That's because it's emphasizing. So it's we wouldn't say truly, truly. We'd say this is really true. This is very true. So the way they say that is they just repeat the word. Very few things get repeated three times. Uh, the letters, or excuse me, the number six gets repeated three times. Six, 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 the mark of the beast. So seven is the number of perfection. So six is the number of imperfection. And so imperfection or brokenness multiplied to the extreme is the mark of the beast. Uh, you get a few other words, whoa, one time. But, but the big point, and R.C. Sproul uh, wrote a whole book on this called The Holiness of God. The big point that he makes is that while God is perfectly loving and God is, is completely uh, full of grace and he's, he's absolutely righteous and he knows everything, right? I mean, while he's perfect in all these attributes, the only attribute of God that gets elevated to the third power is his holiness. He is holy. So these angels, they, they, they are just declaring that he's holy. And Isaiah gets called up into this, and uh, the passage goes on, and, and in verse 4 he tells us that, the, that the, the sound of their voices declaring the holiness is so thunderous that the whole temple is shaking, and there's smoke. I mean, it's, you know, it's, just this, it's this completely overwhelming place, and Isaiah's response is to immediately fall on his face and say, I'm done, like I'm dead, I cannot survive here, I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Uh, so he is in the presence of perfect perfection and goodness, he realizes how incredibly bad he is. And he is broken by this. And he's overwhelmed by this, and he can't stand it. So he falls down, and he's, he's sort of like, I'm, I'm done. And then we have this gospel moment. We have this atonement scene here where it says one of the angels goes over to the altar, which is where the fires are to consume the sacrifices. Remember, when we were in the study of Exodus last year, said that the temple that was to be built... Uh, that, that Solomon builds and then later will be rebuilt, but that that temple was modeled after a temple in heaven. And so there is a temple, and they're in this temple, and there is this fire burning, and, and one of the angels goes over and he takes one of the white hot coals out of the place of atonement, and he goes over to Isaiah and he touches Isaiah's lips which sounds really painful, but obviously very symbolic. Isaiah's a prophet, so he makes his living talking to people, and so he's being purified at this level. And, uh, and Isaiah is consequently forgiven. Right? We have this little gospel moment. Again, the, the, the gospel is that it's, it's all about God's love and God's provision, right? This isn't Isaiah who's about to do the right thing, but this isn't after Isaiah does the right thing that he's forgiven. This is before Isaiah does the right thing that he is forgiven. He has repented, right? He has fallen on his face and said, I'm in trouble, I'm broken, I need help, and this angel comes and he is forgiven. So the equation is not faith plus works equals salvation, but faith equals salvation plus works. Isaiah is going to respond by doing the right thing. So we have that, and then we got these great words, the, the call of Isaiah, verse 8. After all this has happened, the Lord says, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah 
says, here am I, send me. So, there's a lot that, that uh, I have thought you need to hear at this moment. Right? You know, I, I want to say things like, presidents come and go, right? but, the, but the kingdom of God is eternal. I want to say, uh, if, if you are... Uh, if your mood dramatically changed this week, then you're probably uh, identifying too much with a political party and not enough with Jesus. Like, you, that we've got to be shaped by Jesus, not by, not by others. I want to say, like, if, if, you're, if you have been panicky, I want to remind you, like, God wins. Like, we know how this, we know how this plays out. You do not need to panic. Nothing in heaven has changed. God is still on the throne. His kingdom will come. We can live knowing the score at the end of the game. I, I cannot say that what's going to happen in the next 90 days or four years or whatever. I, I don't know. <clears throat> there may be uh, political reasons or completely other reasons that we will suffer. But remember, that is light and momentary affliction that is producing for us an eternal weight and glory. You have to live today in light of eternity. We have to shed our headlights beyond this world. And, and, and eternity changes everything. I want to say, right, you can be the non-anxious presence. You can absorb pain out of the system. You don't have to be triggered by good things or bad things because, like, this ends well. So I, I want to make that point. I've, I've wanted to make the point that, uh, that the way we see the kingdom of God come is by love, not by political power, right? We cannot vote in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will never arrive on Air Force One. This is not going to happen. And so we need need to understand that we are called to love others, including our enemies. When James and John said to Jesus, uh, they, they asked Jesus whether or not they could call down fire from heaven on the Samaritans, who were their political enemies. Jesus' response was to say, have you not been paying any attention to what's going on here at all? Like, what do you mean, call down fire on the Samaritans? No, we're going to love the Samaritans. We're going to reach out and care to the Samaritans. The Samaritans believe some things that aren't true, and, and we'll have those conversations, but, but, but the, we are not going to get what we want through politics. I'm not saying politics aren't important, but I'm just saying we have been called to love. I've been in conversations the last, often on the last year, in which uh, people have been making the point that, you know, we, now is not the time for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control because the, the stakes are too high. We can't, we can't do that. We, it's too risky. And I want to say, no, you're wrong. This is what we are called to do. This is all we have. So I, I, I want to I help reframe people's thinking and their panic. Now, there's a lot of political things that I would say to you. I'm not a political leader. I'm a pastor. So I, I want to be sure you hear other things, and there's a lot of those. I mean, I, I want to be sure that you are remembering 1 Timothy chapter 2, where we are told to pray for the president, and ask you, have you been praying for President Biden? Right? I, I, I want to I encourage you to be praying for the president-elect, and praying for the governor, and, and this is, we're told to do this. I want, to, I want to suggest to you that you and I should be more worried about the sin in our own heart than we are in the heart of the president or the president-elect. And then I want to remind you that I wrote this sermon before I had any idea who the president-elect was going to be, right? We are called to pray for our leaders. I also want to, um, I also want to suggest to you that there is a need, and this has sort of been a growing conviction 
for me over the last year and, and then really sort of crystallized more a couple weeks ago when we had Robert George here. If you were not here, we had this Lake Light talk. Dr. George is a very, one of the most impressive sort of academics I've ever been around. The folklore is that he left West Virginia. His father was a coal miner. His grandfather was a coal miner. Nobody had gone to college and, you know, around there. He shows up in college barefoot uh, and with a banjo on his back. And uh, 10 years later, he not only has a college degree, he has a law degree from Harvard, and he has a PhD from Oxford. And then he lands in his 20s. He lands his very prestigious position at Princeton. He's been at Princeton for 40 years. And he's, you know, written 30 books, and he's done all kinds of things. He's He's headed up UN studies on human rights and freedom of speech and freedom of religion, and he's done all these things. So very impressive person. Uh, You could listen to, I interviewed him for an hour, that's online. Afterwards, we had, uh, he was at a a dinner, smaller group, not recorded, and, um, and had a chance to ask him some questions sort of, you know, a little bit, uh, where he was a little bit less guarded, and he said, look, Here's the deal. He said, I teach politics at an Ivy League school. Smart students. And he said, the fact of the matter is, the students don't understand how the government works, and almost none of the adults that I interact with have any idea how the American system is supposed to work. He says, nobody gets how fragile it is. Nobody gets how they have got to make this work. And he says, I'm not just saying some people need to be involved. He goes, I'm saying no one is exempt from trying to keep this American democracy going. And so I, I, what I started to realize and think about a few years ago was that I, I'm around a lot of very competent people who grow businesses and grow careers and grow all these other things. But not all of them. There are, there are many of you who are serving. God bless you. I, I'm not suggesting no one's doing good things. But there's a lot of people who say, I'm just so frustrated with the government. It's so inefficient. It's so corrupt. It's so this. It's so that. But there's no willingness to get on a school board or, you know, coach a little league team or do any of the kind of civic things. Build the social fabric that we have to have if this form of government that we have that is unique and that is fragile is going to require. So I have a lot of thoughts about what needs to happen. I want to underline the two things that that jump should jump off the page for us out of Isaiah chapter 6. Number one, our vision needs to be consumed with God. Like, we have to be looking at him. (laughs) You and I are responsible for ordering our hearts. Like, we need to order our loves and our fears. We are told... The book of of Psalms is one example. We are told to talk to our heart and to correct it from the wrong things that we hear. We are told that we need to hold every thought captive to Jesus. Like so people just people just respond and often responding to the all the stuff that we hear, all the things that people say, you need to you need to be worried about this, you need to hate this person, you need to you need to think about this. And and the Bible would say, no, actually, you don't need to worry about that, and you shouldn't hate that person, and you should be focused on this. So you are responsible for your heart. Just, we are responsible to speak to our heart, to speak truth to our heart, and to order our loves and our fears. And that, that starts with having this all-consuming vision of God. Now, our small group this week, one of the things that we reflected on was that we would like more of a vision from God. <laughs> like we'd like to be called up in, into the throne room. Like that would settle a lot of things. And I, I hear this from people a lot. Like I, I need, I'm not hearing from God. I need to hear from God. I, I want to hear more from God. And I understand that. Uh, look, we don't control whether or not we're going to have some supernatural vision. Uh, we don't we don't get to control that. What we do get is we get this book. And so we have been given a book in which God reveals himself. He tells us about himself. So there's, there's two ways we know things about God. Primarily, we know things through what we call general revelation. There's things that we can deduce about 
the creator by looking at creation. It's sort of general information. But then we have special revelation. And special or supernatural revelation of God comes first and foremost through Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says, if you want to know what God the Father is like, you look at God the Son. He is the radiance of God's glory, the, the exact representation of his being. Right? So, so the, the, primary, the primary revelation of God the Father is God the Son. We also have the book. We have the Word of God incarnate, Jesus, and we have the Word of God written. And so God reveals to us on these pages who he is, his character, his nature, and the things that we need to think. So we can't control getting called up into heaven and seeing God as Isaiah did, but we can be students of the book. And we need to speak this truth to our heart. I thought one of the interesting things that George said is, we moved out of the age of reason with the Enlightenment, and, and uh, excuse me, we moved out of the age of faith and the Enlightenment, we moved into the age of reason, <clears throat> We moved out of the age of faith with the Middle Ages. We moved into the age of reason during the Enlightenment and modernity. And we've now moved into the age of feelings. And we're, we're guided by our feelings. And that doesn't work. <laughs> like, that just doesn't work. I'm not saying your feelings don't matter, but our feelings can, can mislead us. And we need to speak truth to our heart. So the first thing I would say to you is that uh, we need to be filled with the vision of God. The second thing I would say to you is that we need to serve. Isaiah's response to the vision was to say, when God says, who am I, I going to send in? Who's going to do my work? Isaiah's response is to say, put me in, coach. I'll do it. Like, here am I. Send me. And so if you've been at Christ Church very long, you've heard me say that it is incumbent upon you to find places to serve. Formal and informal, inside the church, outside the church, all kinds of different places where you can decide I am going to use my gifts to serve other people. It might be hard. Being on a school board would be enormously hard right now. But, but I'm going to do the things that need to happen to serve other people. So you've heard me say that, that uh, you need to serve. You've heard me say that everybody wins when you serve, starting with you, because it changes your heart, and this is what God wants of us. You've also heard me say that I think the primary place that Christ followers should serve is through the church. Because, first of all, I don't think the other institutions, the family, the state, business, the media, I don't think these other institutions have much of a chance of working if they don't see people who are being changed by God. And while there are other institutions that are caring for the poor and doing wonderful things, wonderful things, the church is unique in the sense that it is both proclaiming the good news and engaging in good works. And so I call on people to serve in the kingdom of God. That one of the best things that you can do politically is, is to love God and to lean into the commission that we've been given to go and make disciples and to care for other people. So uh, I'm out of time. I'm past time. Don't tell anybody. Uh, well, what I want to do for us is I want, to, I want to pray, and I want to pray in light of the instruction that we've been given in 1 Timothy 2 to pray for our leaders. And so I invite you to join with me now as we pray. Lord God, we, uh, we pause now to say that we are thankful for the, the many blessings that we enjoy in this country at this moment the freedoms that we have, we can complain about lots of things. But when we look at the, at the last thousands of years around the world, we have been blessed and we are thankful for that. And we're thankful for the many privileges and blessings that we enjoy as Americans living in this country. We want to pray for President Biden as he uh, and Vice President Harris as they navigate the next couple months, all the confusion and anger, all the global hot spots, all the tension points. Uh, pray that you would give them wisdom. Pray that you would give President Biden resilience. Uh, pray that you would, you would help uh, people to, to lean into their better, uh, their better halves as they navigate these difficult political moments. I want to pray for President-elect Trump and uh, Vice President-elect Vance, 
I want to pray that you would uh, give them wisdom. I pray that you would surround them with people that, um, that will give them good counsel. pray that you would give them uh, your favor as they are selecting members of their cabinet. Uh, pray that you would give them energy and resilience. pray that you would keep them safe. pray that you would uh, pray that you would help them to hear from you and to be led by you in ways that, that lead to the flourishing of people here. Father, the world is, is so complicated. The, the situation in Ukraine, the situation in the Middle East, all, all the hot spots, the uh, hot spots around the globe can't imagine the, the pressures and the challenges of trying to navigate that in any sort of coherent way. So we, we pray for also members of the cabinet and for senators and members of Congress and governors and uh, all the people that are trying uh, to serve and to navigate this. Father, give them wisdom. Help us to see how we could serve. Help us to see ways, again, big and small, where we can be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Help us, help us to see others who are hurting right now or who are misdirected right now. Help us to find ways to help them and to guide them and to help take anger out of the system Help us to be the non-anxious present that, uh, that can help Thanksgiving meals go better than anyone expects. Help us to be that person. Help us to have a, a, a more robust understanding of who you are, high and exalted, seated on the throne, train of your robe filling the temple. Help us to rest in your promises. Help us to rest in in the the certitude that we have that this ends well and that your kingdom will come and that we could live today as as we are citizens of the city of God right now in the midst of this broken city of man. So, Father, we pray that that you would keep us united, uh, a church that is made up of people with different political convictions, that, that others would look on and say, huh, how are they getting along and, and perhaps be slowed down to realize that, that, that we are more defined by you and by your call in our life and by Jesus than we are defined by political philosophies. So we set uh, all these things before you and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I send by putting our eyes on Christ, keeping him first in our hearts. Let's stand to our feet. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence, my life. Be thou my wisdom and thou my truth.
High King of Heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, oh bright heaven sun. Praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father. himself be our vision this week. May you see and lean into opportunities to serve others. If you would like someone to pray for you, there will be people up front who would welcome a chance to do that. Now may the love of God the Father, grace and the mercy of his risen Son, our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, and the power and the fellowship of the Spirit of God be and abide with each and every one of you now and always. Amen.